very familiar with the image. Now let's find out about the artist who created it. Edvard Munch was born in Norway in 1863, 160 years ago, before electric lighting, indoor plumbing, cars, telephones, and most significantly in Munch's case, before the advent of modern medicine. Munch's mother died when he was only five and his sister died when he was 12, both of tuberculosis. Munch may also have contracted tuberculosis, at least he feared he had. Then, when he was still only 26, his father unexpectedly died of a stroke, leaving Munch responsible for the support of his younger siblings as well as his aunt. Barely out of art school and not yet an established artist, he had no money, no reliable source of income. He turned to relatives for help, but they refused. So Munch took on the responsibility alone, but it was difficult. Thus, illness, fear of illness, death, and feelings of abandonment came to dominate Munch's thoughts well into adulthood and even into old age, and they are the most recurring themes in his art. As he wrote in his personal journal, without anxiety and illness, I am a ship without a rudder. My sufferings are part of myself and my art. They are indistinguishable from me, and their destruction would destroy my art. Well, maybe yes, and then again, maybe no. Munch's talent was so great that he could have successfully made a career painting any subject matter. But now, 80 years after his death, he is mainly remembered by the general public as the artist who painted the scream. But he was much, much more than that. Besides being the year in which Edvard Munch was born, 1863 was also the year in which modern art began. In 1863, French artist Edouard Manet submitted this large painting, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Luncheon on the Grass, to the Paris Salon. It was rejected, of course but it was exhibited next door in the Salon de Refusé, the Salon of Refused Works, where thousands flocked to see it and be outraged by its shocking subject matter. It was not the nudity that caused all the stir. Western art had always been full of nudity. No, it was the woman's bold look, her obvious lack of decorum, and the fact that she was not Venus or Cleopatra, but a modern-day Parisian woman who had taken off her clothes in the presence of two men in broad daylight in a public park. What was going on? Well, nothing. It was simply a made-up scene from the artist's imagination. It was not meant to be real. Artists have no mandate to paint only visual reality. Edward Manet became a hero to the avant-garde and helped inspire the art movement known as Impressionism. By 1880, the year Edward Munch entered art school, Impressionism was a widely accepted style that was already morphing into post-Impressionism, the more abstract, colorful, and highly personal style of Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Cezanne. Edward Munch, whose mature work will always be highly personal, stylistically abstract, and not strictly tied to visual reality, fit right in. Munch spent most of his life in and around Christiania, today's Oslo. Like today, 19th century Oslo was a lively, cosmopolitan, and prosperous city. The art school Edvard Munch attended, now part of the Norwegian National Academy of the Arts, was first rate, and it still is. At age 18, Edvard Munch was already a promising artist, as these freshman year paintings show. But in his second year, Munch became a star, especially in his ability to do portraiture. He also began to use brighter colors, simplify his compositions, and experiment, tentatively at first, with Impressionism. It was then that the trouble began. As Munch became more daring and personal in his approach to art, he began to receive criticism. When he exhibited this full-length portrait in an Oslo art show, a critic dismissed it as Impressionism carried to the extreme. It is a travesty of art. Not much of a criticism, actually, but Munch was pretty fragile and did not take criticism well. At around the same time, he began having heated arguments with his father. Munch's father, Christian Munch, was an army doctor and a single dad. While Dr. Munch had paid for his son's art school tuition and was more or less resigned to the fact that he would become an artist, this move away from traditional realism did not sit well. And then there was the issue of Munch's close friendship with Hans Jaeger. Ten years his senior, an anarchist, and leader of Oslo's wild, hard-drinking, free-love-espousing bohemian crowd. Dr. Munch was enraged and, well, as frightened for his son and for good reason. 
However, as unconventional and dangerous as Hans Jaeger may have been, he recognized that young Munch was struggling with unresolved issues from childhood, centering around the untimely deaths of his mother and sister. He had what today we would call PTSD. Jaeger suggested that Munch begin a journal in which he could write his life and explore and reflect on his emotional and psychological state of mind. So in 1886, when Munch was 23 years old, he began recording his thoughts in what he called his soul's diary. Munch had been keeping sketchbooks of his drawings since he was a teenager, but his soul's diary went much further. He embarked on a period of deep self-reflection, and it profoundly changed his art. If Munch were alive today, he would probably be constantly checking his phone and sending out text messages whenever something occurred to him. But just like text messages, his running commentary of his mental state was not necessarily written for the ages. It was a private record of what he was feeling at any given moment in time, subject to change. And it contains lots of wild, unfiltered statements. But after his death, these journals were widely published and are now frequently quoted as a way of definitively explaining Munch's art, giving rise to the widely believed myth that Edvard Munch was a madman. Untrue. Munch was no madman. He actually had an excellent understanding of his ongoing struggles with anxiety, depression, illness, and alcohol, all issues for which he sought medical treatment. However, because he was also an exceptional writer, excerpts from his soul's diary have sometimes taken precedence over actually looking at the works themselves. Here's a much quoted example, written in 1893, only four years after his father's death while he was struggling to keep his family together and establish his own career. The sky turned red as blood. I stopped and leaned against the fence, feeling unspeakably tired. Tongues of fire and blood stretched over the bluish black fjord. My friends went on walking, while I lagged behind, shivering with fear. Then I heard a great, infinite scream ringing through nature. All of us, if we live long enough, will experience moments like this when we feel overwhelmed. This is not madness, this is life. And this is what Edvard Munch depicted in his art. Let's look at some of his paintings, translating his soul's diary into less dramatic language. When I received word that Dad had died while I was away studying in Paris, I was numb with shock and grief. Alone in my hotel room, the world lost all color and light. I thought we still had some time together, but now I'm left to make my way alone without him. I'm frightened. Here I am walking by myself on the other side of the street while a crowd of well-dressed people pass me by, unseeing, uncaring. They are like zombies, having a good time while I struggle for love and acceptance. I love this woman so much. She was my best friend, my angel, and my muse. But she broke up with me, and I feel as if my heart has been ripped out of my body. Now I sit alone by the lake where we spent so many happy hours together. What went wrong? Was it my fault? Might I be able to get her back? Why did my sister have to die? Why did I get to live? This is not fair. I miss her so much, and I always will. This woman was not good for me. It was an abusive relationship from the start. She sucked the life out of me like a vampire. But now that I think of it, I was like a vampire as well. Why do I still obsess about her? I was lucky to have gotten out alive. So, while we may not hear a great infinite scream ringing through nature, when we look directly at Munch's art, his meaning is clear. He never tried to be mysterious or enigmatic. That's why his art continues to be so popular. On some level, we are all Edvard Munch. This saga has a happy ending. Munch's career was extremely successful. Although always controversial, by the first decades of the 20th century, he had become one of Europe's most sought after artists. He had numerous shows in all the prestigious galleries, books were being written about him, important collectors were buying his works. He became a wealthy man. But his hectic schedule, overwork, and widespread celebrity increased his anxiety and his drinking spiraled out of control. In 1908, at the age of 45, Munk collapsed and he had himself admitted to Dr. Daniel Jacobson's rehab clinic, where he stayed for eight months. And he recovered. 
although he continued painting and repainting the same themes of lost love and early death at the same furious pace, his style and subject matter gradually changed. Now sober, by the 1920s he began concentrating on colorful landscapes and portraits, including lots of soul-searching self-portraits. He also began taking selfies with his camera, an entirely new idea at the time. In 1933, he was awarded Norway's Grand Cross of the Order of St. Olaf for outstanding contributions to his country. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Dr. Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for watching.